Well, once again, we've had problems with Zoom. And so uh, when we did this particular uh, uh, class, we uh, our Zoom for some reason shut down after about 15 minutes. And so we did not get the entire uh, video um, for this uh, this week, which is a study on the general epistles. Because of that, we do not have the uh, discussion that followed as we continue to um, uh, go through this. And I apologize, the discussion is always good. And uh, we we uh, are sorry that we don't have the, uh, uh, have the, the discussion. So we're gonna look at the general epistles. Such evidence as survives from the last four decades of the first century reveals that the churches were by heresies distressed as well as by schisms renaissance. Digressions from truth occurred in every direction and constant vigilance was necessary if the Christians were to keep their faith pure. Five short epistles, Second Peter, uh, first and second Peter, Jude 1, 2, 3, uh, and John, were written to cope with these trends toward false doctrines within the church. Controversy was not their sole aim, nor was their subject matter devoted entirely to attacking heresy. Their approach was positive rather than negative, as their outlines will show. They were, however, all colored by the dangers of the times in which the church was threatened quite as much by the subtle infiltration of paganism into its thinking as by the frontal attacks of persecution. From without. Merrill C. Tenney. So here's R.C. Sproul talking about the general epistles. In the New Testament, we have that group of books that is called uh, the general epistles, in which is normally incorporated the book of Hebrews. But in addition to Hebrews, we have some other uh, books, such as the book of James. Uh, then we have the book of Jude, the epistles of St. Peter, and the epistles. of John. Now, for the most part, these are all short and brief uh, writings, and so we're going to lump them all together for this segment today. And we'll start by looking, first of all, at the book of James. And James is important for several reasons, the first of which is that of all of the books in the New Testament, James is the only one that follows a particular literary genre that we <clears throat> recognize as being wisdom literature. We recall when we looked at the wisdom literature of the Old Testament that I mentioned at the time that there was one book in the New Testament that also was subsumed under this category of wisdom literature, and that is the book of James. And James, of course, was Jewish, and his writings uh, sound very Jewish, or they, I don't know that they, they sound that way if you read them aloud, but they have the flavor of a, uh, of a Jewish author. And we don't know for sure who wrote the book of James, but if there is a consensus, the consensus would be that the book of James was written by James, the brother of Jesus. James, who presided at the Council of Jerusalem in the early church. We know that this blood brother of Jesus, one of the later children of Joseph and Mary, was not a believer in Jesus during his earthly ministry, but by his own testimony became a believer after the resurrection and rose to a position of prominence in the early church. His nickname was James the Just. 
and sometimes he was referred to affectionately as old camel knees because the man spent so much time praying that he developed these large and noticeable calluses on his knees. But the other thing that is distinctive about his book is that we find in that little, bic, little book of James more uh, quotations that sound so similar to the style of aphorisms that were used by Jesus than we find in any other book of the New Testament. And so there is this idea that when we're reading the book of James, we're getting some information from the original teachings of Jesus that can't be found anywhere else in the New Testament. And that gives us a certain richness to the book. But following the style of wisdom literature, we find many short, pithy statements that are used throughout the epistle, and it doesn't follow a, uh, a unified chronological order uh, of one major theme, but James jumps around between different themes or among different themes, as the case would be, and he's fond of speaking of of ethical concerns that confront the Christian community and often sets things in a parallelistic format, many times antithetical parallelism. If you recall, we learned how the wisdom literature used that device of parallelism, and John will speak in couplets and so on. At the beginning of his epistle, he is concerned to give encouragement to people who are enduring trials and tribulations. He says at the beginning, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 2, my brothers, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And if any one of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. And so he immediately addresses a situation of affliction, of suffering that his fellow believers are enduring, and then talks in very practical terms about what it takes to endure in the midst of suffering and persecution, to understand that the trials that we experience on a human level are tests of our, faith, of our faith, ways in which God brings us to a higher level of sanctification, and the way in which we are to face these difficulties is with wisdom. And if you recall in the Old Testament study that the Jew understood wisdom not in an abstract philosophical sense, but wisdom to the Jew was the practical knowledge and understanding of how to live a godly life, how to live a life devoted to righteousness. And that's the motif, that's the accent that James gives us in his epistle. He has much to say about the law of God and of works, and some thereby have set his writings in opposition to the writing of Paul, since Paul speaks about our being justified by faith and not by the works of the law, and yet James is zealous to show us that true faith will always work itself out in terms of obedience. That yes, we are free from the law of God, but that freedom is what James calls a royal liberty, that we have not been freed and to the point of licentiousness, and the freedom of the Christian is not a license to sin, 
but rather it is a freedom to be empowered by the Spirit of God to please God by our obedience. And again, much of this teaching that he gives is reminiscent of the teaching of Jesus. For example, he, he reiterates the significance of letting your yea be yea and your nay be nay and not swearing unlawful oaths or swearing by things other than the, the, the person of God, swearing by idols and so on, as Jesus himself related in the Sermon on the Mount. We also find in James that magnificent treatment of the deadly power of the human tongue. Almost an entire chapter is devoted to the perils that we face when we live with tongues that are not controlled. And you recall the, the imagery that James uses there when he describes the tongue as being like unto the rudder of a ship. It's a very small piece of the ship, and yet that tiny little piece changes the whole direction, controls the whole movement of the huge boat. And so it is that little piece of flesh that is in our mouth can change the course of our lives, and it's like a spark that can set a forest on fire. And it's like uh, an animal that can't be tamed. And he goes on and said, we have been able to achieve mastery and dominion over the animal world and have been able to, to tame all kinds of beasts of the field. But no one as of yet has been able to tame the tongue. And it's, it's a masterpiece of practical application of the Word of God to our lives. Also, James goes into detail about the need for godly prayer, and he holds up Elijah as an example from the Old Testament of a man whose prayers were efficacious, and in his encouragement to the community of his own day to be forbearing in prayer, James says that Elijah was a, a man just like we are, and he, through his prayers, he was able to shut up the heavens for three years and then bring the rain when it was needed and so on, and he then gives us that uh, classic statement that the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man avails much. And so he stirs up his readers with these encouraging words. If anybody is hurting, if anybody lacks anything, let them pray. Call the brothers together. Spend time on your knees. He's l exhorting people to do the very thing that he did. And it's something that I guess, and this is speculation, but it's not all that risky speculation. It's a pattern of behavior that I'm sure he witnessed in the life of his own brother. And I've often said, if, if we were to have the opportunity to ask Jesus to boil down the essence of the faith that he delivered to his church and asked him to give us the top priorities of our behavior. Jesus, what should we do more than anything else? What should we be concerned about? I wonder what Jesus would say. Well, we don't know because he never said that this is the one thing that, that, that it all comes down to. But the next best thing would be to have the brother of Jesus come to us and we say to the brother of Jesus, what's the most significant thing that we should be doing as believers to be pleasing God? And of course, the answer that James give, gives to that question is extraordinary. Few people guess it, but at the end of his epistle, after he's given all these exhortations and all these admonitions, he says, and above all, above all, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. And then he says, the essence of true religion is the care of widows and orphans. Do you see how practically, uh, or how practical James is in his concern and in his orientation? Who would imagine that any apostle would say that above all, first and foremost, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay.
And yet, it's reminiscent not only of what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, but it's reminiscent of his words before Pontius Pilate when Pilate asked him if he uh, was a king. And Jesus dodged that question and say, I, I came into the, for this purpose I came into the world to bear witness to the truth. Because to the Jew of the Old Testament, speaking the truth included keeping your word. In fact, the thing that makes God so truthful is not only that what He says agrees with reality and corresponds to real states of affairs, but when God says yes, He means yes. And when God says no, He means no. And that when God makes a promise, He keeps it. When God makes a covenant, He fulfills it. And so it's not really surprising when we analyze how central it is to, to the sinful life of the breaking of promises and of the violation of our words that we find the manifestation of sin. And then it shouldn't surprise us that he says, above all, we are to be people of truth, people whose word can be trusted, people who are keepers of the covenant we have with God rather than breakers of it. Or, as James says, to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Well, if we move then to the epistles of Peter, we have only two that bear the name of that great apostle. And we see that the major theme in Peter's writings is similar to that that we've found elsewhere already, and that is that the major theme is encouragement for Christians who are engaged in suffering and affliction. Now, let me just say a word about that before we look at the text itself. A strange phenomenon has occurred in our day with the preaching that we hear on television and elsewhere that has been called the uh, prosperity or health and wealth gospel. And the basic essence of this is that God wills for His people nothing but blessing, prosperity, and happiness. Come to Jesus, all your problems will be over. That the gospel promises health and wealth and prosperity to all who put their trust in Christ. And all we have to do to experience these benefits from the hand of God is to name it and claim it. Well, you've heard all that name it and claim it business. And when I hear that, it's one thing to hear it. It's another thing to see the multitudes of people embrace it. And I think, how can people who are at the least bit conversant with the sacred Scriptures be fooled by that? Because the idea of the Christian's expectation of being involved in affliction and pain and persecution is on every page of the Bible. The whole history of redemption and the history of godliness is the history of people, as Peter addresses them in the very first chapter, of pilgrims, people who are living in this world as exiles, people who are participating in the humiliation of Christ. And so the question in the New Testament is not will we suffer, but only when and how will we suffer becomes of the utmost importance. And so at the beginning of his epistle, uh, in the first chapter, in, uh, in verse 3, Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, here... He says, we have been born again to a lively hope. The old has passed away. And what we 
have been reborn to is a heavenly inheritance that God has appointed for His people, and that an appointment cannot fail to come to pass. That inheritance cannot rust. It is incorruptible. It cannot be defiled. It is absolutely certain. And, and Peter says, in that we rejoice. That is, in the heavenly treasure, in the heavenly promise, and in the heavenly inheritance. But what is the tendency in religion is to try to claim for ourselves right now the heavenly promise. We want to have the end of the Christian life at the beginning. We don't want to have to walk the Via Dolorosa. We don't want to have to go through the veil of tears and to the valley of the shadow of death. We want it now. It's a premature grasping after the future promise. Now, we rejoice that this sure and certain inheritance has been treasured up for us in heaven. And, and so Peter says, in this you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see Him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, requiring the end of your, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls." Now, that motif is the motif of the crucible, the place of the refiner's fire the purpose of those fiery trials that we are called upon to endure is not to destroy us, but to refine us. That motif is in Paul, it's in, it's in Peter's writing, it's in John's writing, it's in the writing of James. It is the uniform apostolic testimony that God is using our pain for our purification, for our sanctification, that we may learn to look to Him for our comfort and our consolation, so that the pain, though it may be at times seemingly unbearable, is not futile. It has an eternal purpose. And, and Peter finishes uh, his his work with, with a similar statement in uh, when he, he speaks to the people saying, not to think it strange, beloved, concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings that when His glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. For if you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you." Don't think it a strange thing. But that's what happens when, when people are given false promises, when, when the preachers say, if you come to Jesus, you'll never have any pain, you'll never have any problem. That disturbs me. Because then when the pain comes, these people go through a crisis of faith, and they need to have their faith restored. But they need to understand that God has not failed them because God never promised them a life without affliction. On the contrary, as both First and Second Peter declare, God has called us to participate in these things, and we ought not to think it is strange when it happens. Now, in John's writing, in the three tiny little letters of John, uh, the concern there is to show the love of God in the relationships of the church. One of the main motifs 
is the, the charity that covers a multitude of sins, and that we are to live out a life of godliness that is manifested by faith. Now, again, one of the chief concerns of John in his writings is similar to the other writings that we've seen, the invasion of heresy into the life of the church. And John speaks about the spirit of the Antichrist that is already at work in the world. And the chief heresy that John disputes in his writings is that of docetism. And the And the Docetists were a subgroup of the Gnostic heretics in the early church who denied the reality of the human nature of Jesus. Greeks believed that, that matter or physical things were inherently evil. So it was unthinkable to them that God should ever take upon Himself human flesh. And so the spirit of the Antichrist at that day was a denial not so much of resurrection as it was of incarnation. And so we need to take heed and be careful that not only is it a very dangerous thing when people deny the deity of Christ, as many have, but it is also an extremely uh, dangerous thing when we deny the humanity of Jesus. Both belong to the ministry of the spirit of the Antichrist. We learn a lot from these small books, and uh, I will tell you, um, I don't know how many people have uh, actually heard a sermon on Jude, or even a sermon on some of the books, uh, First, Second, and Third John, particularly Third John. And I will say this: I have preached on both of those uh, uh, books um, simply because I felt like they've been overlooked, and uh, there was a lot of learning involved in in those books. Um, I want to share something about this whole uh, uh, aspect of suffering and suffering for the glory of God, as, as uh, Paul said in, in his epistle, and Peter has reiterated. Um, I was diagnosed at one point with severe arthritis because I was having trouble with my legs and and, and uh, so it was determined that, uh, that I, uh, through x-rays, that it was severe arthritis. And so I was wondering, on the Thursday that I was diagnosed, I was wondering about uh, all this and why, uh, why I was having these problems, particularly because I'm still working and I'm working with athletes and why do I have problems with my legs and why? because it, it certainly could be a problem with me being able to continue my work. So I went to church on the Sunday after this Thursday, and the first, uh, uh, the first message I heard uh, that day was uh, about Peter, 2 Corinthians, I mean, I'm sorry, Paul in 2 Corinthians, talking about the thorn in his side and how he was suffering with this thorn in his side and that the reason he was suffering was uh, uh, to glorify God. And um, I got to thinking about that, but uh, and, and thinking, well, you know, I'm suffering, it's got to be to glorify God. And then it was reinforced by a devotional that Marilyn and I were doing uh, uh, by Spurgeon, and Spurgeon talked about suffering for Christ's sake. And then the third thing that happened that Monday morning, uh, after that was I tuned into Renewing Your Mind, and R.C.'s series on Surprised by Suffering was on Renewing Your Mind. So the first three things that I heard after I was diagnosed with uh, this particular uh, malady was uh, that uh, Christians suffer, and they suffer for Christ's sake. And uh, so ultimately, when I uh, got some more tests done, it was determined that uh, I had a problem in my back, but it also revealed a problem with my bladder. So I was uh, 
seeing two different specialists at the same time for two different reasons. And um, eventually it was determined that I also have neuropathy. So there's different things going on. But uh, uh, I wound up, uh, the bladder sort of took precedence over things and I wound up having an issue and having to have a catheter. And when I had the catheter, I wound up get, having an infection and I had to be hospitalized. And I got to thinking about this when I was in the hospital and now I'm suffering for Christ's sake. Why is that? Why am I able to glorify God through this suffering and what sense does it make? And I got to thinking about the people that were, were attending to me and I got to thinking about that in this way. I thought, these folks, whether they know it or not, are glorifying God in the sense that they're taking all these things that God has placed in our work environment, in, our cre in the creation, and they're taking those things and they're using them to try to fix me. And they do that because God has certain principles. He's given us medication. He's given us... Uh, education and wisdom to be able to overcome some of these problems. So with all that in mind, I, I thought that's one reason that, that I'm glorifying God is because other people are attending me and they're glorifying God. If I didn't have this problem, they wouldn't be glorifying God in this particular situation. I shared that with, with a couple of folks um, that were attending to me, particularly uh, during the hospitalization. And then after I had surgery and I was following up with the neurosurgeon, I'm sorry, the uh, uh, urologist the, uh, who had uh, 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 done the surgery on me, I was, uh, uh, he, he said how much he appreciated my patience during this whole situation. And I said, can I tell you why? And so I started sharing with him the fact that, that uh, I understood that I was suffering for Christ's sake. But even more than that, I was suffering because even may, though you might not know it, the work that you do glorifies God. And if you do know it, that's great. Um, but it glorifies God in the sense that everything that you've learned, everything that you use, all the techniques all the education, all the wisdom that you have in doing this task, you have, you have gained because you can glorify God through your work. I was able to share that with them. And I just wanted to share that because when we think about suffering, it's, it's, it's very self-centered. And I learned through this experience to get that off of the self-centeredness and seeing how God was being glorified by so many different people, not just because I could say, hey, look at me, I'm suffering for Christ's sake. I've got a thorn in my side like Paul did. No, that wasn't it at all. I was suffering so that other people could glorify God. Just wanted to share that at this point. All right, the general epistles are Hebrews, James, first and second Peter, uh, first uh, and third, John and Jude. Why is it important to James to emphasize good works in 2.14 to 26? Well, good works uh, are something that happens not because we decide we want to be a good person, but we are doing it in obedience to the, to the very fact that Jesus has given us life through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he's done that because he did a good work. He did the work on the cross, which in a sense to him was a bad work, but it turns out it was a good work because it was something that freed us all from sin who are in Christ. How can we reconcile these verses with Paul's word in Galatians 3, 10, and 14, and Romans uh, 3, 21, and 22. Well, let's take a look at them. Uh, 
Galatians, as soon as I can find it here. Three ten, handy little Bible here. Um, for as many are of the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who, he who practices them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of, of the law, having become cursed for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung, who hangs on a tree, in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promise of spirit through faith. And then let's look at Romans 3.21. But, a, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. Well, here's the difference. James is talking to those who are not under the curse of the law, because the curse of the law is Nobody can actually do good apart from Christ. James is, is making the argument that those that are in Christ need to do good works because that's what Christ did. Christ gave us the ministry of doing good works. And so Paul is speaking about those that are trying to survive under the law, trying to strive for their salvation under the law. And that's where the problem for those folks is. The law is a curse to them because no one can keep the law. Now, the good works that James is talking about grows out of the fact that now we are not under the law. We are not striving to do good things for our salvation, but we are striving to do good things in obedience to the commands of Christ, of taking care of the widows, of taking care of, of those in need of taking care of the one that's laying on the side of the road and needs help. Those are the things that James is talking about that we need to be involved in as Christians. And that's how we reconcile those words with the words of James and Paul. In 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4, Peter tells us something about our hope. First Peter 1, 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again, a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved for you in heaven. Well, Peter's telling us about our hope. Why do believers have hope? First of all, we're born again. The old has passed away, the new has come. So we are no longer that old person that is, is living under the curse, but now we're living with certain hope because of the promises of, of God. And it was uh, because God has mercy, um, that's why we've been born again. And we have the living hope through the res resurrection of Christ. He was raised from the dead, and that gives us hope that there is something beyond dying. And um, we have this inheritance, and we know we have the inheritance because Jesus was, was uh, ascended to the Father. And as he was ascended, he gave people the hope that they will also ascend one day to be in heaven. Uh, again, here's we have an inheritance that is certain. It is one that cannot be taken away. Uh, nobody can go to court and argue against our inheritance. It's there. It's been given to us. In verses 5 to 9, he addresses the problem of enduring through trials. 
why are believers able to greatly rejoice in the midst of trials and sufferings? Well, um, we find this, um, we who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice even now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Christ. This is what R.C. Refer referred to as the crucible. The crucible is the fire that separates the bad stuff from the good stuff. It's the, it's, it's the refining process. And because of that, we can endure. And the trials that we go through, the sufferings that we go through, the things that we don't quite understand why, the whys of life, are because we're being refined. In John, 1 John 1, 1 to 4, why do you suppose it was important for John to open this letter in this manner? What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have beheld with our hands, handled concerning the word of life, and the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, that you may also have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And those things we write so that our joy may be complete. Um, he discusses the fact that the word of life was not merely seen or heard, but touched with hands. The word of life, Jesus was, was real, and people were able to touch him. They were able to be, a, uh, be there. And so he discusses the fact that it was important for John to open the letter that way to reinforce the people to understand that Jesus was real. He was not some mythical character but he was actually real. Which general epistle has been classified as wisdom literature? Oh, I was James. And uh, so it was a little bit different than the other epistles because it was con it's considered wisdom liter uh, literature along with, with Psalms, Song of Solomon, um, and... Um, uh, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. James denies that justification is by faith alone. False. He never denies that. He just adds works to the to what we should be about in obedience to Christ. James devotes an entire chapter to the dangers of what part of the human anatomy. That old tongue, you know, it says, you, uh, once words are out, it's like trying to put toothpaste back in the tube. You can't do it. It's out there. The words are out there. Um, they're hurtful sometimes. So we need to be careful of what the tongue does. What is the major theme found in Peter's epistles? It's encouragement and suffering. And again, we've talked about this, so we understand that, that we need to be encouraged in suffering because it's the refiner's fire. What is John's primary purpose in writing his three ep epistles? To, remote, to promote love in the church. What is the chief heresy that John addresses in his letters? Well, we we see all these in, in, in some way in the New Testament. This is... This is Gnosticism, and it's it's a it's a further outgrowth of Gnosticism. All right, that brings us to the end of this particular uh, study. And uh, uh, after this one, uh, we are looking at the introduction to Revelation. And if you are viewing this online. That uh, introduction to Revelation is already up there and ready to be viewed.
Uh, thank you for viewing our Shear Elective Series. Uh, this class is online in a Zoom call on Sunday mornings at 9.30 a.m. So please send an email to Dennis Drennan at gmail.com for the link for the class. If you enjoyed viewing this class, please subscribe to the YouTube channel, Dennis Drennan.